absolutely top-notch stuff for the last decade. Now on BBC4, Brian Kay with the story of light music. Our lives today are saturated in music. We have music on demand, downloads from the internet, product on CD and DVD, a myriad of analogue and digital radio stations, an apparent infinity of choice. Imagine a time not so long ago when few of us owned record players and fewer still owned a television set. It's sometime in the late 1940s. The war is over. Let's switch on the wireless. Here the new tune. BBC Television presents A Little Light Music. This is the story of yesterday's music, British light music, which had its golden age in that post-war decade between the start of the BBC's light programme and the rise of youth culture and popular television in the late 50s. Hello everyone and welcome to our programme of contrast in light music. This is the music of the Backroom Boys, who composed and arranged for radio, film and television. It's all tuneful, easy to listen to music, but it's properly orchestrated and it doesn't have to be driven by somebody banging drums. That's the key to it. It's the story behind those sweet melodies that poured out of the wireless to speed the housewife's domestic chores. Good morning and welcome to Housewife's Choice. It has to be immediately appealing. And it usually is. I can't think of any light music that doesn't have immediate appeal. It's the signature tunes and whistleable melodies that unlock memories like musical time capsules. Light music is the authentic soundtrack to the lost decade after the war and its quirkily British social history. When you're listening to it, you think, I know this music. I've heard it somewhere before. Well, you, you've never heard it through your ears. You might have heard it through your heartbeat. You might have heard it through the atmosphere in which you live. Top-notch stuff. In short, music for everybody. everyone. This is the BBC Light Programme. It's the first time we've said those words, BBC Light Programme, which we hope are going to mean for you now and in the days to come all that is best in radio entertainment from nine o'clock in the morning to midnight. Within a month of the euphoria that greeted the end of the Second World War in Europe, the BBC had launched its post-war radio services. The new light programme and home services both had hours of airtime to fill and an inexhaustible appetite for music. Almost all, as it were, live. It was played by orchestras in the studio and there were an enormous number of them. The BBC had eight staff orchestras. Now you think about it, eight staff orchestras, each with several programmes a week and each one wanting to do their own distinctive style. You are hearing the signature tune of the BBC Dance Orchestra. The tune is called, It's Just a Time for Dancing. BBC Radio needed music, and above all, it wanted light, entertaining music that it could build programmes round. Music to use for its call signs and signature tunes, and to broadcast comfortably to every corner of the nation. Over the next ten years, the wireless would both establish and nurture a new generation of light music composers, at the same time as plundering the immediate past for its nostalgic glories. Light music, because it is so strong in characterization, tends to be rooted in its time and place, and, and people will always think of a, a TV programme or a radio programme when, when they hear a particular piece of light music that wasn't the signature tune. Everyone, I would imagine, would recognise da 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 dee, da 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 dee, by the Sleepy Lagoon, Desert Island Discs.
possibly the most iconic of all radio signature tunes, simply chosen by a producer from a gramophone record. It was the work of a composer who had defined light music before the war and would still be the most widely heard and played in the post-war period. Eric Coates. Coates was living in Selsey at the time and there was a pebble beach. And in the distance, at the other side, were Bognor Regis gasworks, which apparently glowed pink of an evening. If you set your imagination working while you're listening to it, the mood of the music, which is quite passive, helps your mental images develop. And there are little touches in the piece which just help you conjure up a sort of painterly image, even if you've never been there. It's a French waltz where you get um, pa, uh, nothing, rather than um, pa, uh, pa. Uh. That always gives you that sort of additional sense of rest. It's much slower than most Viennese waltzes. It's actually not a million miles from the rather more serious music of Eric Satie. The Jamnopédies are very much sort of slow French waltzes where you feel that nothing is happening very, very still, which is exactly what he wants to portray, of course, here. Like music composers are not afraid to write in a vein of sentiment that others might regard as a little indulgent, but people want sentiment that is not going to be tragic. They just want something that is pleasantly sad, you might say. Mood music is perhaps a handy definition of a lot of light music. And whatever the mood, Eric Coates seemed to have a melody to suit it. A special skill soon spotted by the producers of radio's first celebrity chat show. Stop! Once again, we stop the mighty roar of London's traffic, and from the great crowds, we bring you some of the interesting people who've come by land, sea, and air to be in town tonight. The Knightsbridge March, the London Suite, was Coates' big breakthrough in 1933. He became a celebrity pretty much overnight. It was anonymous at first, but so many people wrote in saying, what is that piece of music? I simply must get the piano version of this or buy a 78 record of it. Flat in Baker Street was besieged by fans wanting an autograph and they had to have a policeman outside the staff entrance and to stop people trying to sneak up in the, in the goods lift. And the BBC had 20,000 letters the week that the march was first aired, so he definitely caught some sort of national feeling, if you like. Good evening, everybody. I am now going to conduct my new march, which I have called London Bridge, and in which I have tried to convey a picture of the thousands of people who walk across London Bridge every day, to and from their work in the city. I think there was an appetite in those days for London music. Of course, it's all Coates' London. He's not writing London music on anything other than the sort of London that he knew and loved. Mayfair, Oxford Street, the sumptuous plush hotel and the quiet Sunday Square. The posh bits, if you like. There weren't any tenements. A Nottinghamshire doctor's son, born in 1886, Coates came to London to pursue a career as a professional viola player but something about the city and city life fired his imagination. He spent a lot of his time walking around London, thinking of his ideas. Primary human impulses, walking, marching or dancing, seem somehow to have produced Coates' best work. 
His music became part of the fabric of British life. His marches and waltzes, filled with beautifully shaped, refined melodies, glorious orchestrations and life-enhancing rhythm. But even as the bombs and the blackout were changing the face of Coates's London forever, he'd started to compose the music that would first help win the war, then help to win the peace. Calling all forces overseas and workers at home. On the 23rd of June, 1940, the BBC began an experimental series of programmes called Music While You Work specifically designed to encourage greater productivity in the mass production of weapons of war, they provided a diet of rhythmic music as a constant accompaniment to the monotonous regularity of manual labor. Serious audience research was commissioned. The BBC was determined to get it right. Hundreds of factories were visited to study listening conditions and to learn the opinions of the men on the job. What did he say? Music while you work. It's a wonderful tonic that cheers us up every day. It gives us a break, although we continue to work and helps us to carry on afresh. It was his wife working on sewing machines in a room full of women doing war work that gave him the idea for the counter melody, which goes over the big tune that everybody remembers. There you've got the sound of wartime, the effort of wartime, all encapsulated in a little musical gesture. Today is victory in Europe's day. Calling all workers. The end of the war, alas, doesn't mean the end of hard work. Business, trade, industry, they've all got to go on, and each day we must take the early road to work by bus, train or tube, without much let-up, but with a cheerful spirit, if possible. With the arrival of peace, Music While You Work still found a place at the heart of the BBC's radio schedules. It now motivated the daily tasks of five million factory workers and just as many listeners at home. There was a music while you work sort of committee and nothing was allowed to go out of tempo. Everything had to be bright, up tempo, nothing below a certain number of beats per minute. I know there was a recommendation not to use pieces that were too rhythmic. Deep in the heart of Texas was banned because workers tended to treat it as the sky at night is clear at night. Deep in the heart of and they were banging their equipment and so on. Now this is the way to get a man out of the army and back to a nice quiet life in Civvy Street. Within three years of the end of the war, nearly four million people had left military service to look for work, to start families and to build a new life. Ernest Tomlinson was 24 when he was demobbed from the RAF. I got a copying job at £4.10 a week with a firm that dealt with mainly Shills and Blackpool, Opera House and all these things. I wanted to be an arranger. I knew there was a lot of work in arranging. I, I, I didn't give any thought that composition would be something I could earn a living at. I'd renewed acquaintance with a certain Jean Lancaster. We met again after the war. and. Uh, as a 13-year-old, I'd played some of my pieces to her, so I immediately thought, oh, I'll write something to be able to play to Jean and see the presser that I've gone on a bit since then. Well, that piece was called Passe Pied, and just as Ernest and Jean were getting married, it became his first success as a composer. We got to our honeymoon in October 1949 and uh, got a telegram saying, please send the score and parts off past year. And so I thought, oh, no. So we looked at the Radio Times, it was on next week. And so we sat there on the honeymoon and listened to that first performance. It really was.
was a musical family. My father was a fine amateur conductor of a male voice choir. As a boy chorister, he'd been taken to Manchester Cathedral. Uh, he was probably about 12 or 13. This would be early 1900s. And he always wanted his children to be musical as well. Some years later, not just one son, but three sons were in Manchester Cathedral Choir, which is something of a record. This sudden exposure to the most marvellous music made me want to be a composer. So from the age of nine, my future was determined I was going to be a composer. My um, last day as head boy of Manchester Cathedral Choir was August 31st, 1939. What happened next, I hear you say? <laughs> Uh, well, Hitler invaded Poland and our whole life was changed forever. When I went to my RAF medical, I got through everything fine until they came to the colour vision and they found I'm colourblind, which I knew, but I didn't know this, this uh, didn't allow me to be air crew. So they said, what trade would you like? And I said, well, uh, musician. Oh, golly, you're A1, you can't be. <laughs> anyway, um, he said, well, would you like to be a wireless mechanic? Well, I didn't know then that everything in wireless is colour-coded. And I loved it, actually, though I still I always had to ask somebody else who I was stuck for the colours. To learn radio and electricity from fundamentals was marvellous. One of the great things it did was teach me to think scientifically, cause and effect. Because if you've been arts, everything's arguable about. Isn't it, you saw? And, and uh, I'd had a very narrow artistic uh, training until then. Writing good tunes was not quite enough for this generation of composers in the post-war world. Some, like Ernest, had studied harmony and counterpoint at music college. Others learned their trade playing in dance halls and cinemas, but they all had to be willing and able to arrange other people's music. Musicians had to be able to adapt the pop tunes of the day for any number of combinations. And the music publishers had full-time staff arrangers who would work nine to five every day producing hundreds and thousands of arrangements of the hit tunes of the day for any combinations from barrel organ upwards. I did at least 1,500 arrangements. I've still got my logbook, so I can see who it was. A lot of singers, particular Clark, Benny Hill in their younger days. In, in bands, you'd got Ted Heath and Geraldo and so on. Arrangers particularly had to often make a sort of organised orchestral music out of other people's sort of scratchings, if you like, so this sort of pride in their craft became their raison d'etre. I never wanted people to say, that's a fine arrangement. I wanted them to say, what a grand orchestra, what a super piece of music. I didn't want them to... That. So I tried to do it what that particular broadcaster was wanting and I could earn enough from radio broadcasting to um, live quite comfortably, bring my family up, and so on. Let us face the future for a better society for all our children. The nation wants food, work, and homes. The nation wants a high and rising standard... The new Labour government promised a new era. Britain would build a better tomorrow with new towns, nationalisation and a welfare state from cradle to grave. For the BBC, here was an opportunity for a new style in public service broadcasting. We are here for your pleasure. We are here for your entertainment. We crave your indulgence. We beg your applause. We are your servants. People have been through some years of enormous suffering and they, they've seen terrible things they've been involved in awful things 
Now they want a music that is going to make them smile, that is going to make them feel good. Now the time is nine o'clock. Time for Housewives' Choice. Good morning. I feel very important today in being asked to start this new series. The BBC have now decided to do something for the real backbone of the country. A woman who spends her time getting her children ready for school, cooking her husband's dinner, and standing in a queue to get that dinner. In other words, the British housewife. The wireless becomes incredibly important after the Second World War in terms of women's daily lives. Women who became full-time housewives or combined housewifery with paid work spent a great deal of their time in the home. So to some extent, programs like Housewives' Choice were very important as a companion for women. But they were also important in terms of trying to tell these women what they should do, what their interests should be. The notion of the housewife was something that was still new to the daily experience of many women. We're going to give you, every morning, 50 minutes of records of your own choosing. Requests on postcards, please. Anyway, I'm going to plunge straight into the first record. Nice tune for this time of day, the Manchester Children's Choir singing Purcell's Nymphs and Shepherds. I must say that your choices have delighted me. They're so much more serious in tone. And now, Mrs. Wilcock of Clitheroe, I'm sorry that if I'm right, that's the recipe you want. Mrs. Northcott from Leicester has asked for Bless This House, sung by Gracie Fields. Bless this house, O oh Lord, we pray. Make it safe by night and day. Housewives' Choice and programs like it were also important in perpetuating a myth of the ideal home and also very much of the woman as a domestic citizen, as someone who wasn't too interested in larger scale economic and political issues and whose concerns very much centred on her home and on her children. Good morning to Mrs Eileen Howitt, who lives in Tilehurst, Berkshire. Mrs. Howitt says, Will you play for me, please, our fascinating signature tune all the way through? My husband says it sounds like a lot of women gossiping. Well, that's a fair guess, Mr. Howitt, because it's called In Party Mood. Live music was an imposed culture. It was there to help or make you forget the austerity and to, to force you to cheer up. That's what live music does above all. You have to be cheerful. Rationing is still going on, but optimism for the future is enormously strong. And people feel that society is changing for the better. Desirable consumer goods were on display everywhere, even if there wasn't always the money to buy them. Television sets now began to join radios in the home. By the close of the decade, the idea of a home entertainment system was beginning to take shape. Of course, the price of, of 78 recordings had been falling, and you get cheap recordings. Woolworths start selling recordings. And light music is, is one of the things that sells extremely well. Captain Robert Farnham had composed two symphonies and started to develop a tongue-in-cheek big band style back in his native Canada before he came over here with the Allied Expeditionary Forces Band. He found the British light music he'd heard inspirational. The war had just finished, and in he comes, carrying a pile of scores. There he was in his brown demob suit, which the Canadians had, and uh, you could see he decided to stay here, and uh, thank God he did. 
What Bob Farman was to bring to the light music scene in the late 1940s were his enormous gifts as a composer and arranger, plus a little extra something. Glamour? A sophisticated sparkle? All the movie orchestras and the studio orchestras for the films were writing in that glossy way. And Bob did bring that with him when he came over, sort of transatlantic pizzazz. I think one of the really characteristic features of Farnan is his ability to surprise you with the, the unexpected note. Uh, one of his famous pieces, Jumping Bean, begins, and this is extremely <laughs> difficult to sing. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. It, a group of notes that are rather awkward. He's very comical. <laughs> piece of his that did it for me was Jumping Bean. And the funny thing is that on the back of the 78 that was issued, I think, towards the end of 1948, there was a piece called Portrait of a Flirt. But when I took the record home with me, I didn't play that. And I can remember coming down the next morning and my, my father said to me, have you heard that lovely piece of music on the back of Jumping Bean? I said, no, because he'd been playing it when I'd been asleep that night. And when I heard Portrait of a Flirt, well, what an amazing piece of music that is. In fact, in light music, if I was asked to name an equivalent light music classic recording that would equal something like Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane, which came out on one record, two sides of one record, I'd say Robert Farnan, Jumping Bean, Portrait of a Flirt, an absolute classic. <laughs> I don't think anyone was writing that kind of music in Britain at that time. It's something entirely new. There was a lot of colour. The way you orchestrated it was full of colour, whereas the light music that, that I'd grown up with didn't have that same glamour, you know. It was that marriage of American dance band idioms with the sound of the traditional light orchestra. Although Farnan comes from the same world as Coates, used the same lineup in the orchestra, he does treat the orchestra rather differently. Um, I think that comes from his dance band background, writing for saxophones. You'll find often you get that very close harmony saxophone voicings put to the string, something like. Um, sort of thing in Portrait of a Flirt. Very closely voiced chords, if you like. I think Portrait of a Flirt is a good example of just the kind of musical mood that, that people were looking for. And flirtatiousness it's not something that you can find a whole shelf full of records at your local record store. Not just that, but other kinds of moods, the capriciousness. Nonchalance. Just an air of well-being. These are the kinds of moods that people want in that period. He was one of the most comfortable conductors in the world, although he said he wasn't a good conductor, but he was. I suppose you need any special qualities as a conductor for that repertoire, a certain lightness of touch to understand the style thoroughly. For the instrumental feature, we now call upon our resident solo pianist, Douglas Gamley, who has made this delightful arrangement for piano and orchestra of the Westminster Waltz. Westminster Waltz he loved, and that actually got in the charts. 
I looked up the New Musical Express, and there it was, number 10 in the bestsellers, and nothing had been spent on it in the way of promotion or, or ads like they are today. Bob finally came along, there was sort of popular dance music. And then there was classical music. And there was this light music that was kind of like uh, junior classical music. And now the shipping forecast. There are warnings of gales in Shannon, Rockall, Hebrides, Bailey, Farrar, Faroes, and South East Iceland. Post-war light music buzzed with new ideas in sound and style. The younger generation experimented with ways of combining the tradition they'd inherited with a desire to update in keeping with a changing world. And in his own quiet way, Ronnie Binge was the avant-garde. I'm surprised to hear that Jarvis Cocker had it recently in his uh, Desert Island Discs program. He had it in the body of the program, and then when it came to the end, and for his special one, he wanted it again. I've for many years used this as an aid to restful sleep. I find something very comforting about listening to it when you're laid in bed. And also on a desert island, it'd be happy because it would, well, it would remind you of the fact that there are boats out there listening to the ship and forecast and some of them might sail nearby so you could get rescued. This would help me, this would be like something that could help me deal with that isolation, I think. sailing by. It seems to be a very simple piece of music, but it just captures that ripple of the ocean, doesn't it? The tide perhaps just coming in or coming out. A ship in full sail with gentle gusts of wind running through the sails, seagulls maybe. Spice smell can be part of it, the smell of spices. It can conjure up all those things and make you try hard to get a sense of what that place that the ship is in or coming from might be like. Maybe you're thinking this isn't a bad way to spend an afternoon in company with me, Mike Carey, and memorable melodies when we go back to the old days and play the kind of music you thought you'd never hear again. Mike has always had a fondness for the music of Ronald Binge, and he wanted to know more about the composer behind his luxuriant string sound. I read that he came from Derby, and I was intrigued. I decided to try and track down his origin. He was just a typical Derby person, born into a very ordinary working class background, just an ordinary little terraced house in the Normanton district, and then a, another similar sort of house on the other side of Derby, and uh, in neither of these were particularly grand places. In the late 20s, early 30s, there was quite a strong, vibrant music scene in Derby with uh, little orchestras, little groups uh, dotted around the place playing for Friday night dancers. There was a famous cafe of the era called the King's Cafe in the city centre, which is now a shoe shop, and all sorts of um, local musicians uh, gravitated there. And Ronnie was in that orchestra uh, playing who knows what, a bit of light music, or the occasional standard from the 1920s. That's where musicians learned their trade, wasn't it, in those days? Enter Mantovani, a dance band leader who was experimenting by replacing his brass section with an accordion. 
In the mid-30s, he hired a dashing young accordionist, Ronnie Binge from Derby. The Mantovani Orchestra was basically a string orchestra. It played uh, dance music, it played classical music, uh, salon music as well. Very versatile outfit. They could actually play about 80 numbers without music. Annunzio Paolo Mantovani was born in Venice at the turn of the century, and he came to London as a teenage violin virtuoso. By the end of the 30s, his orchestra was a firm favourite on the fashionable West End concert and broadcasting circuit. In 1940, things began to change. He became more interested in light orchestral music. And of course, Ronnie got called up. I can't see that we would have met if it hadn't been for the war. I would, you know, a lot of people. He was in the Air Force and uh, he had one eye that wasn't very effective and flat feet and he decided he'd take an exam. Well, I worked then for the education officers and in the evening we got these jobs to do. Well, I got this thing and it said, Ronald Binge. And I said to the, you know, just before I left in the afternoon, I said, fancy having a name like Binge. So anyway, I went in and there this very bright pair of eyes turned round and looked at me, you see. And we were married a year later. He told me he was a musician. And of course, my mother thought, a musician? What does he do? How does he earn a living, sort of thing? When he came out of the Air Force, he decided then that he wasn't going to go back to playing at all. He wanted to be a composer. Luckily, Mantovani was on hand with the offer of a job for Ronnie as in-house composer and arranger for the orchestra's new recording career. Decker were one of the pioneers of long playing recording techniques, and they wanted an orchestra to compete with the American orchestras. They wanted waltzes to take on the American guys. And so they alighted upon Mantovani. And uh, this is where Ronnie Binge came into his own with these wonderful delayed string arrangements. He came up with this sound with uh, what they called it. It wasn't really an echo chamber. People thought there was an echo chamber, but it wasn't. It was just one note holding on and, and being used into the next note. He realised in cathedrals that you could hear the echo long after the music was played, and uh, so he, he built this into some of his arrangements. I thought it ought to have more uh, strings than anything else. And really, this was my own plan, you know, in the beginning. And um, the, the echoing string effect was just a sort of trademark. Uh, I just simply wrote out, orchestrated the echo as it uh, would really appear without any mechanical aid. Mantovani is on record as saying when he looked at the, the first arrangement, he, he was very puzzled. He said, I'm not quite sure what Ronnie's trying to do here. We were all a bit on edge waiting to see how it was when they broadcasted, really. It was a sound that nobody had really ever come across before. It was quite unique. A very intimate, pleasing sound. And uh, suddenly, everybody wanted to hear it as a single. It didn't take off until a disc jockey in America played it something like 26 times in one day. During the early 1950s, Mantovani 
decided that he had to go out on the road with this large orchestra. Ronnie decided that he'd finished with that. That was one of the reasons why he wanted to stay at home, so that he could write. So they didn't see each other at all, hardly after that. By the, captain's by the early 50s, light music business was booming, thanks to the BBC. Radio had now been joined by BBC Television, Britain's only TV channel. Moving pictures and light music were a marriage made in heaven, and broadcasters soon discovered where they could find the music they needed for their programmes. All of us were involved in what is now called library music, where actually we called it mood music there was this great need for background music, and the publishers supplied it. The TV broadcasters had to pay every time a piece of music was played on television. The massive demands of their nightly comedies, dramas, quiz shows and newsreels encouraged the music publishers to produce special free records for TV use only. Imagine all these television producers, they'd have stacks of these 78s and be sent to them all the time. Whatever the mood required, there was a light music miniature to suit. I wrote over 200 mood music pieces, and one or two of us still going strong. The one's called k k, -k, -k <laughs> A little thing called falling asleep, and it keeps turning up. It only lasts about 15 seconds. And you get little royalties here and there, pound or two here and there, it all adds up. Broadcasting isn't like it was, but it's like a nice pension. Star Wars, Superman, Dallas, Dynasty. Right for big man. Angela Morley spent 20 years in Hollywood as a composer and arranger. But her technique was honed to perfection in the tough commercial world of mood music. To write music for film and television, you've got to be really quick. And you've got to be able to sit down for 12 hours a day at least and produce the goods. They would ring up and say, oh, you know, we're having another recording and we would like you to do uh, a few things. And they uh, would say, well, now, what is it that you need? And they would say, well, we want to do some pieces for animals, you see. There was a cure rope for penguins, and then there was one for ponies. It's called a rotten row. Because anybody in England knows rotten row is that place in Hyde Park where people go riding their horses. Rotten Row definitely fits into the sort of clip-clop category and as such stood a very high chance of being used for whatever sort of newsreel dramatic purposes. It may have a purely commercial inspiration but the craft and the sort of seriousness of the writing is every bit as sort of secure as it would be for a concert piece. I remember when I was a child. In those days, there was no television. There was just the radio and the, the gramophone. And I remember we had piles and piles of dance music, and I was always playing these records. Before I could read, I could identify which record was which music, you know, from the colour of the labels and all that. When I was eight, I was sent for piano lessons. And those are the only lessons I've had. After that, my mother bought me an alto saxophone. I taught myself how to play that. And then I found that they, they allowed me to sit in the band of the local dance hall. I was 15. I've been earning my living from music ever since. 
western states of America are facing the most bitter winter they have had for 60 years. Over wild and desolate country, the air fleet starts out on the most extensive animal rescue operation ever staged. The airmen, muffled and goggled against the cold, drop out bales of fodder wherever cattle are to be seen. Angela is one of the great arranger orchestrators of all time in that popular music idiom. All those special sounds which Angela gets, which nobody else seems to get. Beautiful, restrained use of the strings. Absolutely exquisite use of all the instruments in the orchestra. I think there is a different public for light music who are not prepared to sit and wait an hour for the music to end, you know. I mean, I'm sure there are many people who would love to sit down and listen to Eric Coates or, or Robert Farnan or somebody uh, who would not want to go to Covent Garden uh, and see the ring. By now, the BBC had a well-established light music department, and 1952 saw the formation of the BBC Concert Orchestra, the only one of its light music orchestras to survive to this day. From head light music program, brackets, sound, to controller music, 30th of January, 1953. The so-called BBC Concert Orchestra is essentially a studio orchestra which does not give concerts. The BBC has always had a difficult relationship with musicians. It has never really known how to classify them. But being the BBC, it had to have some structure on which to build this orchestra. Without wishing to attempt to define the best in light music, I would suggest that the following characteristics are desirable. One. The music is of proven popularity for a mass audience, or two, in the opinion of the programme officials involved, it is likely to have an immediate appeal to such an audience. The programme officials were now of the opinion that the radio audience needed a programme devoted to the best in light music. And Friday Night is Music Night was born with its thrilling mission statement, Music for Everybody. Friday night was always the highlight of the week as far as the public was concerned. When I joined the orchestra, it became, that was the, the fixed date in the, in the calendar. And I think its appeal lies in the fact that it really is music for everybody. I was born in 1972. I have no nostalgic sort of feeling for any of this material. It's lovely music, interesting music of all different genres. If you study Coates' scores in detail, which I have real detail, you'll see that only the great composers equal him in craft, if not breadth of sort of emotional range. Although the sound of Coates' music was now everywhere on radio and TV, the man himself was in poor health and he composed little until the middle of the decade. Then Associated British Pictures made a special request to the elderly composer. Could he write them a march on which they could base the score for their new film, The Dam Busters? The story behind the Barnes Wallace Bouncing Bomb. More than any other piece of British light music, the Dam Busters March seems to have entered British folklore. It now takes on a sort of nostalgic hue, if you like, for sort of days lost and. It's attractive all over again for different reasons. But it's 
Charlie Black Label. And perhaps one of the reasons light music now evokes this period in our national life so precisely, much to the delight of those who make TV commercials, is because it captures a vanished world of coziness, cheeriness and togetherness. You only had one radio set in the house, I imagine, unless you were fairly rich, and uh, you all had to listen to the same stuff. Elizabethan Serenade was on the radio every day. That would have been one of the very first things I ever heard. Mantovani had first recorded this Ronnie Binge tune before their split, but it wasn't until the mid-50s that its big moment came. It was written during the time when I was still writing for Mantovani. I had no idea it was going to be successful. I started it in the morning after breakfast and finished it in time with the five o'clock post. And everybody was surprised when it was popular. The piece caught a new mood all over the country, a signature tune, as it were, for Britain's new Elizabethan age. From here on, Mantovani was set for global success. In 1955, when he made his first American tour, the whole place went crazy for him. Mantovani, or Monovani, as they used to call him in America, was the biggest British artist before the Beatles came along. But British society was changing. The flip side of the new Elizabethan age was a dangerous subculture of rock and roll, teddy boys, and rebellion. The writing was on the wall for cosy, cheerful music for all the family. Light music began to be seen as an embarrassment with some of its easy effects. It suited the mood of the time it was written in, but it was beginning to sound to some people twee, old-fashioned, the sort of stuff parents listen to. When Eric Coates died in 1957, the light music world was already beginning to shrink. <laughs> Over the next ten years, nearly all the familiar features of post-war radio would be transformed by pop and showbiz, until finally, by 1967, there was no place for housewife's choice and music while you work. Now, what about I'll be home for Sunday? How about this one? Always try it. Get tuned to Radio 1 or 2, 5, 4, 3. Radio 2, Radio 1, go. The voice of Radio 1. Anything like it had been in the 50s and 60s was gone. The rock bottom was about 1979. There was nothing on Radio 3, nothing on Radio 2, other than more or less the pop side. That's all right, isn't it? We'll put that one in. Nineteen seventy-nine saw the death of Ronnie Binge. He lived quietly with Vera, crafting a string of successful light music gems right up to the end. He says, "Not only have you got to do good work, but you've got to have a bit of luck on your side as well." But you see, his music's gone on and on and on. They're still playing it. The following year, Mantovani died after several years of illness. Mm -hmm. 
Bob Farnham had seen the writing on the wall. He realised that whilst light music was a lot of fun, the radio days were over, and if he wanted to be taken seriously in the future, he should put all of his tremendous talents into film and TV soundtracks. And boy, did he succeed. A real genius. His heart was in the more serious music. Yes, he became king of light music for this country, but I remember once somebody sent me from Holland the Dutch Radio Times in a program of evening music, and it was Haydn, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Brahms and Farnham. That lit him up, you know. BBC said there was no need for light music programmes and said that light music was dead. And as I think Bob Farnham once pointed out, it wasn't that light music was dead, it was just the BBC were in the process of burying it alive. I was in the BBC library one day to get an arrangement which I'd broadcast previously, and the girl said, it's in that skip over there. I said, for heaven's sake, what are you doing? She said, well, see, just music we don't want anymore. We're just sending it, to, you know, putting it for scrap paper. In the barn of his Lancashire farmhouse, Ernest has built up a unique archive of manuscripts and scores, the library of light orchestral music. Now we've got something like 35,000 bags. I knew, of course, that it was going to take a lot of room, but also, if I didn't do it, nobody would. I look, looking at orchestral music, I just look leafing through things that, that turn up. It is a treasure trove, and I don't think people realise quite what Ernest has done. He's saved God knows how many unique pieces from the furnace. Gradually, we found that with a lot of music, we're the only source. It was there to serve a function, and once that function had been fulfilled, they didn't need the material anymore, so they thought. Of course, it's my generation, musicians working now, who either have to reconstruct the things themselves or be very grateful to the likes of Ernest Tomlinson for rescuing them. So the real question is, does this music from the past have a future? Well, forget the 40s and 50s, the black and white film and the radio voices, and let those unforgettable melodies linger on. Thank you.